through the upper room discourse, this farewell conversation Jesus has with his disciples uh, before he is going to depart them and go to the cross here in Starting in John 13, he washes their feet, and all the way to 17, you hear his beautiful prayer for his people. And so in John 14, we're in the middle of his conversation with his disciples. Uh, Judas has just left to go out into the night. He was revealed as the betrayer, and Peter has just been told that he was going to deny Jesus three times. And so ending at chapter 13 and into 14 is really in the middle of of what's going on in all of this, even though there's a chapter division. I mean, this is one continual con conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And so in 14, there's a switch here from speaking to Peter at the end of 13 and to back to all the 11 disciples who are present with him. And so I invite you to open your Bibles or your devices to John 14, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 14. Be focusing on Jesus being the way and the truth and the life, those familiar words, but how that uh, is drawn out through the context of uh, the beginning of this whole chapter. So hear God's word from John chapter 14, starting at verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so. Would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Do you not believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his words. Believe in me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. Let's pray and ask for his guidance this morning. Lord God, the God of our word, may you guide us by your spirit this morning as we gather together in your name, as we hear your word that was given to the disciples so long ago yet is so near and relevant to us in our lives today and make that evident lord make that clear to us may your word be a lamp unto our path and a light upon our way and guide us and and help us to understand what you need to tell us in in our hearts and in our lives in jesus name we pray amen There's so many comforting passages throughout the Gospel of John. There's so many favorites within this book. And maybe one of your favorites is the beloved John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And then there's other passages within John. Chapter 10, Jesus the good shepherd who calls his sheep and they hear their names and know his voice. John 11, of course, Jesus reveals himself is the resurrection and the life and showing power of his power over death and the raising of Lazarus. And then John 14 at the beginning too begins with some more words of comfort for us. These words, let not your hearts be troubled. When you're speaking, of course, to the disciples and in the moment that they had just re realized that 
one of their own was going to betray him. And one of their own, Peter, one of the great leaders of the group, was going to deny him. And Jesus kept talking about leaving them, and they were troubled. And yet this is such a universal truth for all human beings throughout time and today of a troubled heart that can attack us from, from time to time. We've all been there, whether we're rich or poor, old or young, new to the faith or an old saint, problem experienced at the forefront of a troubled heart here in our text. And we experience that through circumstances and challenges in health or experiencing a loss, having our, our hopes dashed through a, not getting a job that we're hoping to get, conflicts within family and friends, or even those times where you just feel unsettled and you're not quite sure why. But Jesus reveals to his disciples in, in their moment of trouble and in, in our moments of trouble as well that the remedy to a troubled heart is faith in him. And so I hope you're encouraged with these words just as the disciples were, that in John 14, 1 through 14, we are reminded that we can trust in Jesus because he's the one who provides a permanent home with God. He opens the pathway to get there and provides the power to share in his inheritance that he has won for us through his name. And for Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we'll consider this through three groupings of this text. And so I recommend keeping your Bibles open. Verses 1 through 4, we'll consider the place that he speaks of. 5 through 11, we'll consider the path. And 12 through 14, we'll consider the power. So first, the place, verses 1 through 4. Jesus speaks of the place or, or the life that he provides. So there's one reason... That we had not speak of, of having a troubled heart, maybe another way that you've experienced that. Has anyone ever experienced homesickness? Yeah. Maybe you go away to a, a friend's house or, or go off to camp for the first time, first time away from home. That might be the first time you've experienced such a thing. Maybe even found yourself in the middle of the night wanting to tap out and call mom and dad. You're, with a bunch of people you don't know, you're in an unfamiliar place, it's not your own bed, you want to be back home again, where you're comfortable, where you can be yourself, a place where you know the routine. And for anybody, too, who's moved around a bit, you also know that feeling of homesickness, of being unsettled, and that time that it takes to settle into a new place takes time for a place to feel like home. And even the most adventurous spirits of us can still experience that. I've known of families who've sold everything and moved around for a bit. There was one that lived near Carly's parents who sold their house and they were gonna sail the world for a few years with their family. But it still was only gonna be a temporary adventure. They were going to return to a home base at some point and have a home again. There's this, this draw to having a permanent dwelling place. And in the Bible, too, we see God giving his people places as a, as a place to live and a place that God dwells with them. And we see that in the establishment of Israel and the promised land in the Old Testament. And so naturally, the disciples knowing about Israel and knowing about this promised land and, and, and yearning for it to be like it was when there was a beautiful kingdom under a king, that they, were, they weren't under the rule of Romans like they were at this time. They were disappointed here when Jesus was telling them that he was not going to stay, but he was going to leave. It deflated their hopes of, of building that kingdom right then and there, right where they were. And finally, they could get these Romans out of the picture, right? We could have this special nation of God's people again, here and now. 
even if the disciples were wrong in, in their perceptions of how the kingdom would come, they did have the part right about Israel and the promised land as, as a picture of what God was going to do for his people. The goal of God's people is to have a permanent home where God is and is dwelling with his people. That's the picture of the, the temple in the Old Testament. It was a, a picture of God's dwelling with his people. And you think back to even Eden, where he was dwelling with Adam and Eve in the garden. But here Jesus is revealing that his father's house was not of this world. There was something more, something beyond, and it was not in line with their expectations. But it was going to be even better than the earthly promised land. For one, they're never going to be exiled by their enemies in this place. They would never be subject to drought or famine. And their houses wouldn't experience termite damage or leaky roofs or black mold. No, in this, the Father's house too, there are many rooms. So don't worry, there's going to be plenty of room for you there. And I'm sure it's even going to be ready for you. What a contrast to this promise is, is to what Jesus experienced himself at the beginning of his earthly life. Or you remember or heard those stories of Mary and Joseph walking through Bethlehem and, and having no place to stay, no place prepared for them, no special room, no, definitely not a fancy palace. But he's telling us here, this is not the case for you. And when God welcomes his children in the new heavens and the new earth, you're going to be expected. When we lived here, we lived in the seminary village in Escondido next to Westminster. And I remember our, our first summer, or as we moved in, some of our neighbors had all these pictures and, and drawings pasted on their doors, waiting for their return after their summer assignments. They were expected to be there, and they were known, and they, and they were loved by the community there. And then sure enough, as we got ingrained into that community, after we left for the summer and came back, we came back to neighbors' drawings and, and welcome signs on our own door. We were known and loved and expected. And sure enough, there's thought given to the arrival. Maybe you've had that with a birthday party. People are expecting you to come and, and they're doing it just for you. And this is one of the beauties of this passage. Our everlasting home is a prepared place for a prepared people. When we arrive there, it's not going to be a strange land. It's not going to be a place where you have that homesickness. You're going to find that you're known and, and thought of before you even arrive. You've arrived at a place that's a forever home. No more uprooting, no more longing for something else or something better, and no more separation from God himself. Jesus himself will not only prepare our place, but welcome us there. He'll personally bring us there, he tells us. And during Jesus' first coming here, he's already pointing to the promise of his second coming. Do not let your hearts be troubled. I have a permanent place for you where I am. If it were not so, I would not tell you so. And so receive this first promise in faith that Jesus prepares a permanent home with God. And surprisingly, Jesus tells his disciples that they know the way. However, they aren't so sure. So let's consider verses 5 through 11 together in the path that Jesus reveals that way. Have you ever had those moments where someone puts more trust in you than you're comfortable with or that you even consider for yourself? Like, what do you know that I don't know? You might think, or maybe it's a big exam or a big school project coming up that you're stressing and worried about and your mom was just like, you'll be fine. Like, what does she know that I don't know? Or, or you get to be a supervisor of a shift at work, and I mean, you know how to do your job, but you're a little worried about being in charge, what might come up, what 
problems you might have to solve without your boss around to go to, but your supervisor doesn't seem phased and says, oh, you're ready, you'll be fine. And so Thomas here speaks from that side of things for us, where he says, are you sure, Lord, in verse 5? Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? He's saying, can you spell this out for us? Can you make this really obvious? Just give us a map. I, I haven't seen this place on the maps I have. Maybe give me the GPS coordinates. Just, just work this out for you. I, I want to know where you're going. And we can excuse the disciples for being a little miffed by all of this, right? They, Jesus is going to be leaving soon. He's, then he's talking about this place that he's preparing. This seems to be news to us, but he acts like we already know how to get there and where he's going. And Jesus then reveals that they know the way where he's going because they know him. They know the one who's made the way to the Father possible. Hebrews 6.20 speaks about Jesus as our forerunner, the one going ahead, paving the way. And he's blazed the trail, opened the way, and overcome our distance from God, becoming the only way to be reconciled to God, and that great human problem of being separated from God. And he goes to the Father in order to bring us there with him. Another way of hearing this famous saying of Jesus is, he is the way because he is the truth and because he is the life. He's paved the way by conquering the devil, the father of lies, to bring the truth of God and eternal life. And then conquer death so that you might too have an everlasting life through him. And you might too think, well, I'm not so sure I know the way. I'd do better if I can plug an address into my GPS and it takes it from there. And I just follow those turn-by-turn -turn directions. But God does give us his truth throughout scripture and his word to help navigate our way. Maybe it won't always tell you exactly which decisions to make or what job to take but it's going to give you all the right principles of, for truth and, and for life, of living with him and for him. And it'll give you coordinates that won't steer you in the wrong direction. In Psalm 119, the longest of the Psalms, poetically goes over and over about how beautiful God's ways are. And, and it uses these, these types of words of, of pathway and way and truth. He's pleading that God won't let him wander or stray from the path and the way and to walk with his Lord. This is just one example. Psalm 119, verse 35 says, Lead me in the path of your commandments. Or that 105, your word is like a light upon my path. And so if you know God's word and you know the Jesus of the word that became flesh, you know where Jesus is and has gone ahead of us in heaven with the Father. And so Jesus gives us more than a map to send us on our way, but he gives us himself as the way. He, know that, he knew that we could not get there on our own. And without him, there was no path back to God. He's the exclusive way to eternal happiness with God. There's no other ways, no other methods. No other sacrifice or good works that you can offer up instead. You can't go it alone. You need Jesus. He is the only way. And so following any other way results in the very opposite of this, this truth and promise here. For away from Jesus would only be a dead end. In lies. In death. But Jesus goes on to tell how he and the Father are so closely connected. If you know Jesus, you know the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen God himself. And Jesus has the power of God, and the power comes through the truth and the life that he shares with us. So third, we'll consider the power here spoken of in verses 12 to 14. Power of truth. 
And Jesus speaks to the troubled hearts to put faith in him because he prepares a place and a way back to the Father. But in verses 12 to 14, he assures that even after he leaves, his work will not end. He begins with this kingly decree, truly, truly, or verily, verily, in some of the older translations. Sounds very kingly, doesn't it? This original, amen, amen, so may it be, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Verse 12. And what a grand statement of promise is this. What a blessing that he speaks of here. And just consider how Jesus is entrusting this to the, his, his weak and troubled disciples and all of those weak and troubled followers of him to come through all the ages to come and his followers after, entrusting to them a greater ministry than he even had on this earth. And if we're to think about it from an earthly point of view, Jesus' ministry on earth wasn't even all that long. It was about only three years. He lives to be approximately around 33 years old, it's supposed, and he doesn't even travel all that far from the area of Judea and Galilee. And yes, he, he heals many, he converts many, but what do we read of what happens after he leaves? He ascends to the Father, we read of that in Acts 1, in Acts 2, there's Pentecost, and the, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and then... Well, there's thousands, three thousands were at it that day. And then throughout the book of Acts, you see here of the word and the gospel spreading and more and more coming to know of Jesus that, that knew of him even when he was on this earth. And so you can gather from Jesus' statement here that he does not imply that you're going to do greater miracles and, and wonders and certainly not accomplish the, the redemption that he accomplished that his kingdom will grow larger in number and across a larger region after he leaves. But even beyond just a, a quantity and a number, a really greater clarity arrives after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, and that pouring out of the Holy Spirit. The, the new era of greater clarity of God's redemption has arrived because it's been revealed by Jesus the Son and through all these acts that He's done. This word became flesh, that John tells us. They can, as, as Christians today, we can look at all this in hindsight, in 2020, and, and, and see it all complete in all of Scripture, that disciples were seen revealed to them in, in real time, and still, where he'd have to tell them, you don't understand now, but later you will. And even for us, it, it might be easy to take for granted the, the truth of the gospel that, we're know, that we know and are taught. Might not think too much of a phrase that, yes, yeah, I know Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Something you may have heard over and over again, and it, it loses its, its punch. But don't lose how profound the truths are and the clarity that we're given and with all of Scripture that we have at our fingertips. How many of you are familiar with what's called the Apostles' Creed? Yeah, this old summary of the Christian faith. and it, it, It's quite short, and it's fairly straightforward, speaking about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all these just core Christian summary truths. It doesn't get into very deep doctrines and, and play it all out, but right there in the middle of the Creed, there's the completion of Jesus's ministry on earth what he's doing now and what he will do at the end of this world as we know it or after it speaks of jesus being born and died the third day he rose again from the dead he ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of the father and from there he'll come to judge the living and the dead there he is where he said he was going in this text with the father to the father and then he sustains us from there by the power of his Holy Spirit and the communion of saints and forgiveness of sins and throughout the rest of the creed and promising to remain with us until the end of the age. 
verses 13 and 14, Jesus reminds us of the power of prayer and why we pray. Why we pray in Jesus' name. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring, bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Well, I think it may be wise to, to consider. Does this, this mean name it and claim it type of, of workings of prayer? I mean, especially being back out here in California, you know, stirs me a little bit of some California dreaming again. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a house with a view of the ocean where I can, can, can walk down with my surfboard. Might need a new set of wheels to get around town. So, I mean, just start praying for those types of things to happen? Well, no, that's not what it means. You're right, Gene. In the context of this passage, great things of this temporary life are not what's in view. In the context, I mean, consider here, Jesus is leaving this world to prepare a place for us in his Father's house. He went all the way to death on a cross, paid by his own blood. Why would he then get, encourage us to just get as comfortable and wealthy as we can in this world? This world's only a temporary dwelling place. And I'm sure the luxuries of this world have always been a temptation for many across the years. But you have to wonder if Today, it's, it's even more of a temptation with all the nice things and comfortable things that we have today. Houses are getting better at keeping the elements out. You can just turn a dial to have it at the exact temperature that you want. And in your car as well. Streaming services promise that you're never going to be bored. There's always something new to watch and to listen to. Yet... We should not lose a sense of homesickness for another world, a better world. Amen. That's a healthy desire for Christians. For then you seek the things of God's kingdom, the everlasting kingdom, the world without end. And as Jesus, his prayer mentions this, it's about bringing glory to the Father. So what is it that brings glory to the Father? Well, in the context of the gospel and into Acts and in all of scripture, we we see glory is brought to the Father by more and more becoming citizens of his kingdom across the globe as the gospel spreads. And more and more of those who are created in his image turning away from sin and becoming more and more like Christ. And more and more of his sons and daughters receiving the blessings that he gives to us through faith in Christ all longing to be close to him as he longs to bring us near to him. And in this, uh, if you want to call this in the spirit of, of paraphrasing, you know, Eugene Peterson created the message and paraphrasing a lot of the Bible to put into different terms, felt compelled to rework this passage in, in a little bit different wording to maybe help draw out some of the truths and promises to you. And so just imagine that your best friend is going away. And they're going to go somewhere spectacular, though a little mysterious. But they're getting reunited with their dad, who's done nothing but good things for your family. And he... I mean, in fact, he, he, he not only owns the, the acreage all around, but he, he owns all of the animals, all the cattle on a thousand hills, you've heard. And he has this huge palace with the, the most beautiful grounds and gardens that you've ever heard of. And your friend tells you, well, I'm going to go away soon. I'm going to go to my father's palace. It's an even more beautiful kingdom than anything you've ever thought of or seen. I mean, the harvest is always abundant. And since you know me, you're going to have access to everything that, that I have access to within my father's house. What's, what's his is yours. What's mine is yours. And the pantry is always full. The choicest selections are stocked in the cupboards and the refrigerator. 
And don't worry about finding a place to stay. My father has a bunch of houses, and I'll personally prepare one of those just for you. And since you know me, you know the way to get there. You know how to, there used to be this, this, this canyon that, that was impassable. Well, I made a way for you to get across now. Just, just follow me and be, I'll be sure that you get there safely. And be sure to invite others too. Tell them about this. Tell, the more the merrier. Tell those in your neighborhood, in your schools, and at work. There's plenty of room. And you can share the access to my dad's empire by just dropping my name. Just tell them you know me. Tell them what I've done for you and about where I'm going. And you know what? When it's all complete, I'll personally bring you there myself. I'll come and get you. And I'm really looking forward to you being there with me. The truth is, I, I can't live there without you. So that's why I'm going through all of this trouble to make sure that you can be there with me in my father's house forever. So brothers and sisters, be encouraged in your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who's reversed the curse of sin that separates you from God and prepares a glorious forever home with him. He paved a path directly to the Father and empowers you by his gospel and Holy Spirit to invite others into this glorious kingdom. There's plenty of room, and God would be pleased to use even you in his eternal purposes and to be glorified by you through believing and following in his Son as the way, trusting and listening to him as the truth, and resting and receiving him as the life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did not leave us on our own. You did not leave us in our sin, in a state separated from you. But while we were yet sinners, you sent your son, Jesus, for us. And so that we no longer are your enemy, but be called, be called your friends and be your sons and daughters. And, and that through Jesus, we can make our way back to a permanent dwelling with you. And even by your Holy Spirit, Lord, lead and guide us in the week ahead and all that you have for us. Remind us of the truth of your word and of your son. And so that we may continue to make our way each day closer and closer to you. Help us, Lord, to continue to lean and trust on your son as the way and the truth and the life. We thank you for him, and we pray all things in his name. Amen. Amen.